It's a very special event in the lives of BGU, the Department of Psychology in BGU, and I believe Israel Psychology. We are commemorating the contribution of an intellectual and personal giant, the late Sidney Blatt from Yale University. But we're also opening a tradition of discussing and attempting to understand one of the most ominous problems of our time, clinical depression. The two, Sid Blatt and clinical depression, are really intertwined as Sid has made an enormous contribution to the understanding and treatment of depression. The fact that the Blatt Symposium on Depression is being held here in Israel and that BGU specifically also makes perfect sense as David Blatt has made clear, Sid was completely in love with our country, and he has had a special affinity for the pioneering spirit of BGU. That Thomas Joyner, another giant in the field, is here with us today to deliver the Sidney Blatt Memorial Lecture is yet another powerful, powerfully symbolic turn of event. Thomas, too, is a true friend of Israeli clinical psychology and has shared with Sid a particular passion for the psychological point of view on mental disorders, as well as for bridging deep and comprehensive ideas with the rigor of empirical science. Thus, today, fates converge and circles are closed. Sid was a great person. But what is greatness? I'm finding the words of Alexander Bentley, a contemporary poet, highly cogent in this respect. He writes, through the gates of greatness I heed, take, take up weapons of wit and intelligence, head strong, mind clear, time for victory. I can do this and achieve my dreams Every time I have a dream inside a dream, I become mightier than a shining beam of light that penetrates the black sky. It does take intelligence and wit juxtaposed against the ability to dream and envision to penetrate and illuminate the black. When I came to Yale 15 years ago to embark on a postdoctoral training at the departments of psychology and psychiatry, everyone, including Sid, knew that the primary reason for my arrival was to work with him. Yet Sid, in his typical sobering and generous manner, told me upon my arrival, you should meet and work with other people here. This place is bigger than me. Sid was always like that, passionately ambitious, aware of his worth, but never loses perspective of being nested within other systems, realms, ideas, all of whom he has considered greater than himself. Depression was such a realm. Sid and I shared the conviction that the long hours during which we analyzed data and contemplated ideas matter only to the extent that they are devoted to understanding the dynamics and mechanisms making depression so prevalent and pernicious. Having known Thomas for more than a decade, I know that he shares the very same sentiment. Sid once told me, no one comes to depression research by mistake. Every family has depression. I found this statement both reassuring and inspiring. We were particularly interested in subsyndromal manifestations of depression, those depress depressive conditions that do not enter into the epidemiological statistics of the prevalence of depression because they do not meet full criteria for a discrete psychiatric diagnosis of depression Nevertheless, they might kill. The chart presented here is of a 12-year-old American adolescent 
outpatient whose youth self-report scores f fall just below the clinical cutoff for syndrome, syndrome of depression, but who was profoundly suicidal at intake. Yes, depression may kill, and in many ways. Suicide is perhaps the most dramatic way depression murders. And as Thomas will teach us, it takes more than depression to murder the depressed. But depression erodes the body. It is causally implicated in a wide array of physical illnesses, including, but not limited to, HIV, cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and various forms of chronic pain. Depicted in this slide is a recent finding published by my group, including Tzviya Rudik and, Rudik and Hadar Shalev, uh, physicians from Soroka Medical Center, Silvio Briel, a pain physician from Ichilov Soryaski Center, and spearheaded by my former student, Shira Lerman, who's currently at Johns Hopkins Medical School, conducting cross-legged panel analysis on hundreds of chronic pain patients, we found that the direction of relations involving anxious depression, physical pain, and disability emanates from the former to the latter and not vice versa. So depression in this uh, sample of chronic pain patients predicts an increase in pain and disability. Fortunately, there is a very long list of empirically supported or evidence-based treatments of depression. Depression is one of the disorders that conform to the Dodo Bird finding in psycho psychotherapy research, a term borrowed from Alice in Wonderland and which denotes a situation where all have won and all must have prize. Some other disorders do not conform to this pattern and there are, for some other disorder, superior treatments. Unfortunately, the prize is hardly deserving because depression tend to recur, and only very few treatments are effective in preventing depressive relapse or recurrent, and even those do so incompletely. It was Sid Blatt's mission, one of the, his missions, to understand what, over and above treatment modality, contributes to the persistence of depression. I think he has succeed, succeeded, but before I will tell you how, how, let me summarize briefly Sid's biography. Receiving his bachelor, he was born, first of all, he was born before he received degrees. Uh, he was born in uh, October 15, 1928, grew up in South Philadelphia. He attained his uh, Bachelor of Science degree from Penn State, married Ethel, 1951, they, had, they have three kids, Susan, Jody, and David. He then attained his uh, Masters of uh, Science from Penn State, 1952, a PhD from University of Chicago in 1957, a PhD that was centered around problem solving, alluding to his passionate interest in cognition. He conducted pre-doctoral internship under the supervision of the famous humanistic psychologist Carl Rogers, and then a clinical postdoc at Michael Risk Hospital under the supervision of a famous psychoanalyst named Roy Greenacre. He came to Yale 1960 to the Department of Psychology, switched to the Department of Psychiatry in 63, concurrent with uh, serving as a um, full-time faculty member at Yale, he has complete psychoanalytic training at the Western New England Psychoanalytic Institute in New Haven, uh, in which he was trained by Roy Schaefer and other known analysts. He served as a visiting professor at the Hampstead Clinic, known as the Anna Freud Center, 
and Freud professor at Hebrew University here in 1988. He was an, a prolific writer, published over 220 articles and 17 books. Throughout his career, he dedicated between 12 to 20 hours weekly to uh, practice psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. He has received numerous awards, including the uh, scientific, Distinguished Scientific Awards from Division 12 and 39 of APA, the Hans Strupp and Otto Weininger Award for Distinguished Contribution to Psychoanalysis, the Top Award in Psychoanalysis, the Mary Sigourney Award, and the Bruno Klopfer and Marguerite Hertz Award for contributing to personality assessment. Seed's monumental contributions were diverse. He was an amazing theoretician, and he constantly sought to form bridges between his home theory, psychoanalytic object relations theory, and recent developments in academic psychology. For instance, he was able to translate the development of object relations, a term which he was careful to replace with mental representations of self and others, via Piaget's cognitive developmental theory. I will not touch upon this contribution here. Seed is primarily known for his two polarities model of personality, development, and psychopathology. Which, we will be, uh, which I will be describing shortly. But Seed was also a penetrating researcher. He deeply believed that abstract ideas can and must be measured. So he invented several such measures himself, like the object relations inventory. He was passionate about putting theories, he's included, to an empirical test. So he did. And he has shown compellingly that different treatments are suitable for different kinds of patients. What he used to call the uh, different strokes for different folks dictum, and was also later the title of one of his most extensively cited papers, co-authored with the Israeli psychiatrist Irit Felsen. Moreover, Seed was an extremely gifted pr practitioner, both a therapist and a diagnostician. I urge everyone here to read the interview that Lily Dimitrovsky, formerly from Barilan University, has conducted with him. He loved supervising novice therapists as much as he loved supervising doctoral and postdoctoral students. It is not very well known that he had supervised Thomas Ogden, one of psychoanalysis's greatest thinkers, as well as a score of leading therapists in New Haven, all alluding to his warm personality and his awe-inspiring understanding of clinical material. I once talked with a former supervisee of SEED, who herself was considered a stellar therapist. I don't know what happened to me, I said. I was so productive this year. What happened to you? Sid happened to you, she said knowingly. Sid was also a leader, and his leadership was quiet and unassuming. For instance, he has led segments, alas, small segments, within psychoanalysis to accept research as the central vehicle for acquiring knowledge. Neither Sid nor I were the envying type, types, but I did envy his ability to continue putting together psychoanalysis and science, completely unperturbed by hostile dominant voices from the psychoanalytic community, while I, following him in doing the very same thing, was fuming all the way through. Some would say, still am. Much the same way, persistently and quietly, Seed was leading psychotherapy research away from the horse race strategy of pitting various treatments against each other and towards appreciating patient by treatment interactive effects 
with patients' mental representations of self and others constituting the, a major causal force in treatment outcome. And now back in some more detail to Seed, Seed's most well-known achievement, developing and testing the polarities model. As an avid reader, over the years, Seed has accumulated an enormous amount of knowledge. He was able to see similarities in writings of very different people coming from very different schools of thought. The polarity model is inspired by a very long list of theories from within and outside psychoanalysis. I will do a tremendous injustice to the model, describing it in a schematic way, but have no choice given time constraints. The model identifies two basic personality vectors, relatedness pertaining to a pursuit of nurturing and supportive interpersonal relationships, and self-definition, referring to the need to attain a clearly delineated, essentially positive sense of self. For each vector, Sid meticulously described unique developmental trajectories, personality dynamics, psychopathological manifestations, physical illnesses, and responses to a wide array of psychotherapies. Adding insult over injury, this table summarizes succinctly the clinical and personality features of relatedness and self-definition, also known as the anaclytic relatedness and interjective self-definition style. In the extreme, the motivation, the motivation of anaclytic individuals is characterized but by what is called unmitigated communion, which is strong dependency and a zeal towards establishing nurturing relationships. Uh, for interjective individuals, the, the basic motivation might be labeled unmitigated agency, which is basing one's clear identity on separation and success. Affect regulation, including defense mechanisms and coping strategies in anaclytic individuals are geared towards anger suppression, towards not rocking the interpersonal boat, so as not to lose people. For interjectives, it is not to be helpless, not to be uh, melancholic or um, uh, non-active, and so they use counteractive regulatory measures particularly transforming sadness into anger. The mental representations of anaclytic individuals are characterized by abandoning people, object loss, where the self feels helpless in the face of this abandonment. For interjectives, others are punitive and judgmental, and the self attempts to appease the formidable other via succeeding and then further on succeeding. Anaclytic dep depression is characterized by somatic symptoms and strong feelings of loneliness, whereas interjective depression is characterized by cognitive symptoms, neg negative cognitions, um, uh, low self-esteem, uh, hopelessness, and um, primarily uh, that. We, don't, we no longer use the term neurosis, but um, according to Sid's theory, other forms of emotional disorders uh, which uh, anaclytics suffer from are panic disorder, a disorder that um, uh, is linked to a, the dynamics of perceived abandonment, and for interjectives, the control-based disorder OCD. Anaclytics and interjectives 
are characterized by different personality disorders. Analytics will uh, exhibit dependent personality disorders, borderline personality disorders, whereas introjectives will uh, exhibit con control and separation-based disorders such as narcissistic, obsessive compulsive, and paranoid personality disorder. And now, the million dollar question, is the theory correct? That is, has it been corroborated by research? In my opinion, for the very best theories, there is only one answer to this question, yes and no. The theory has been corroborated in many studies, in many others, it was not. Regardless, it has inspired a huge amount of research and discoveries, which is what theories are supposed to do. I will, br I will very briefly touch upon one instance in which the theory succeeded the Manager Psychotherapy Research Project. I will then describe a series of studies in which the theory has only been partially successful. But this partial success, I submit, has revolutionized what we think of the treatment of depression and the role of personality in it. The MPR MPRP Manager Project was conducted many decades ago at the Manager Clinic in Topeka, Kansas. The clinic was well known for its psychoanalytic treatment, featuring big names in psychoanalysis, clinical assessment, and psychotherapy research. Names such as David Rappaport, Roy Schaefer, Merton Gill, Bob Wallerstein, Otto Kernberg, Lester Loborski, and others. The attempt was to compare classical psychoanalysis with intensive, supportive, expressive psychodynamic th treatment, uh, neither treatments would now be practiced, be, be practiced so overall, this uh, project suffers from low external validity. Regardless, the expectations of the researchers was very clear, that psychoanalysis would be, more eff would be shown to be more effective than psychotherapy, than psychodynamic psychotherapy. Much to the researchers' disappointment, the treatments did not differ. In the 1990s, Sid has gotten a hold of the data. He used the extensive clinical material collected as part of their routine practice at the manager clinic to classify patients into anaclytics and interjective. He used trained raters who have established high interrater reliability. He then reanalyzed the manager data with a patient by treatment framework and found, as expected, as he expected, a series of statistically significant interactions. The overall pattern of this interaction was that introjectives, ideational, self-reliant patients improved in classical psychoanalysis, which respects solitude and separateness, whereas they got worse in face-to-face -face psychodynamic therapy. And the inverse was true for anaclytic patients. They improved in face-to-face -face psychotherapy and got worse in psychoanalysis. This picture depicts just one of the interactions found where the y-axis, the outcome in the analysis, pertained to one of the few measures of the Rorschach who enjoys empirical support, the mutuality of autonomy uh, index, which measures benevolent mental representations of others. The thick line pertains to patients in analysis, the dashed line to patients in psychotherapy. This is for anaclytics, this is for interjective, and as we see, higher is is, is worse. Elevated score means more malevolent mental representation. For anaclytics, uh, from time one to time two, um, 
there is an increase in malevolent representation in analysis, a decrease in therapy, and the inverse occurs for int interjectives. For the statistically inclined uh, among you, the very same pattern uh, is revealed when analysis of covariance is conducted, controlling for baseline uh, levels of the outcome and reputing the uh, possibility of a regression to the mean. So analytics who crave relatedness get better in psychodynamic psychotherapy. It, the ideational interjectives get better in psychoanalysis and both get worse at the disrespective therapies. Even those fascinating results pale in the face of Blatt's work with data collected from the Treatment of Depression Collaborative Research Program, the TDCRP. This work was led by Sid Blatt and David Zuroff, an outstanding personality and clinical psychologist from McGill University in Canada. David, who had also served as my mentor over the years, was kind enough to supply some of the TDCRP slides for this presentation. The TDCRP was a unique trial. First of all, it was the most expensive trial ever, I believe. It costed $20 million. Uh, it was the largest. Um, its aim was, uh, it, it was based on a randomized clinical uh, design. It included carefully, uh, 239 carefully diagnosed outpatients with major depression, and they were randomly allocated to four 16-week treatments. Cognitive behavioral therapy based on Aaron Beck's model, interpersonal therapy based on Clerman and Weissman's model, imipramine, etracyclic, an antidepressant with clinical management, and a sugar pill, placebo, with clinical management, where clinical management consisted of emotional support, but without specific therapeutic interventions. Initial analysis of the TDCRP were disappointing. None of the active treatments was found to be superior. A major improvement was documented in all treatment conditions, including the placebo condition, but there was very little remission. 75% of the depressed patients requested further treatment during follow-up. In terms of rates of change, the imipramine, the tricyclic, evinced the fastest reduction of symptoms, although IPT quickly caught up. CBD was, in some analysis, located in between imipramine and IPT, sometimes with no difference from placebo, probably because of some difficulties implementing it in one of the research sites. Blatt, Zuroff, Don Quainland from Yale, and their other colleagues focused on various factors measured in the TDCRP, which are unrelated to treatment modality. They focused on patient's personality. They focused on the therapeutic relationship, particularly on the therapeutic alliance and on other features of the therapeutic relationships. And when I joined their group, I brought to the fore a, a focus on social relationships, the social context outside treatment. Blatt and Zuroff used an instrument called the Dysfunctional Attitude Scale, developed by Weissman and Aaron Beck, which can be used to measure dependency and self-criticism. What we see in this figure is a relatively rapid deterioration of self-critical patients across all treatment conditions without a treatment effect. The dashed red line denotes patients with high self-criticism. The solid blue line pertains to patients with low self-criticism. And as we see quickly after the commencement of treatment, a difference is evinced. 
and it reaches statistically significance and then grows stronger and stronger mid-treatment after eight sessions. In contrast, dependency, as measured by the dysfunctional attitude scale, predicts an improvement across all four treatment conditions with not, without a treatment by patient interaction. This is a decisive difference between dependency and self-criticism that mimics research in other naturalistic settings, suggesting that self-criticism is invariably bad. It exhibits a formidable vulnerability, vulnerability status. It predicts everything that's bad, and I will later call it a personality virus. Dependency is sometimes bad, but sometimes it's actually protective, and it exhibits aspects of both risk and resilience. This pattern is evinced with self-report questionnaires, such as the ones used at the TDCRP. But with, clinical, with extensive clinical material, we do find the symmetrical vulnerability-related picture that Sid has envisioned for anaclytic and interjective traits. Why did self-criticism erode outcome in the TDCRP? In a series of studies using path analysis based on structural equation modeling, the Blood, Zurof, and colleagues team has managed to explain both conceptually and statistically this adverse effect of self-criticism on treatment outcome. In brief, self-critical patients exhibit a poor outcome because they derail relationships, both within treatment and outside treatment. The upper figure shows that the effect of self-criticism labeled here pure perfectionism on clinical outcome is partially mediated by problems in the therapeutic alliance, higher self-criticism, lower therapeutic alliance, in turn leading to a uh, poorer clinical outcome. Nevertheless, as we see in the figure, there is still an unexplained direct effect of self-criticism on outcome, even after taking the effect on the therapeutic alliance in the, in the account. My interest in the social context has led me to find the missing link aided by Blatt and Zurov's mentoring. The figure in the middle shows that self-criticism not only leads to a, derailed to a derailed therapeutic alliance in turn leading to poor outcome, but it also predicts a deterioration in satisfied interpersonal relationships also contributing to poor outcome. When both interpersonal pathways are taken into account, the effect of self-criticism on outcome is completely explained without the need to specify a direct effect. The table at the bottom shows that the effect of personality on relationships inside and outside treatment is unique to self-criticism. It does not occur for personality disorder variables assessed at the CDCRP. Years have passed. I came back to Israel and have decided to decipher the meaning of self-criticism unrelated to the anaclytic interjective distinction. Vlad Zurov and their colleagues have continued to make fascinating discoveries using the TDCRP data. Before Sid passed away, they were in the midst of a very interesting investigation, examining how patients change in the TDCRP as a function of their therapist's ability. After Sid passed away, I came back home, so to speak. David Zurov and I and our colleagues have, complete, have completed this investigation 
will, which soon will appear at the Journal of Counseling Psychology. Anyone who has known Sid would not be surprised to learn that he continues to publish from the grave. The figure in this slide presents one of the central findings in these investigations. Therapists were classified as either relationally gifted or not gifted, based on a measure of therapist's empathy completed by patients. This was the barrett Leonard's relationship inventory, which was highly influenced by Carl Rogers' theory, another closing of the circle. Take a close look at the um, dashed red line and the dashed blue line and the difference between them. Both lines pertain to patients who were treated by relationally gifted therapists, therapists who were deemed by the BLRI as highly, highly gifted relationally. And what we see here is a difference between patients who have high self-criticism, the red line, and those who have low self-criticism, even though both types of patients were treated by relationally gifted therapists. Very shortly after Sid's passing away, my first academic book appeared in print by Oxford Press, and the book is dedicated to the memory of Sid. In the book, I review the formidable effect of self-criticism on almost every psychiatric sy syndrome possible on physical illness and on suicidality. Many, much of this research has been conducted worldwide, also in Israel, not only by my group, but also by other researchers, including Avi Besser, Professor Avi Besser from Sapir College, College who is here with us today. In the book, I also integrate this research uh, and argue that it attests to what I call the self-critical cascade, whereby self-criticism brings about negative interpersonal conditions, such as the one we've seen in the TDCRP. This, in turn, leads to distress. And in adolescence, distress predicts an elevate, prospectively predicts, longitudinally predicts an elevation in self-criticism. Thus, self-criticism comes full circle in adolescence and appears to maintain itself over time. Seed has always encouraged, ah, okay. I also uh, offer in the book a biopsychosocial theory which explains self-criticism uh, through the interaction between um, self-focused genes, several brain structures, personality traits, self-critical vulnerability, critical expressed emotion, which is a technical term denoting criticism in relationships, and some um, uh, cultural contexts that elevate achievement and individuality as major virtues. Sid has always encouraged me to go my own way. He said, somewhat bemusingly, I want you to disagree with me. You may even attack me, knowing full well that while the former is likely to happen, the latter never will. Sid sought vitality, agency, and zest. He happened to people. This is why. From the Dimitrovsky interview, Sid says, I don't think patient, patients internalize us, but that patients often have within themselves adaptive structures which they have sought all of their lives to attain, but which have been unexpressed because they've been caught up in pathology. We free those adaptive elements. That was Sid's modus operandi. He freed the adaptive structures in people around him. Sid happened to them so that they become what they might. Which leads me to the pleasant task of introducing another greatness. When Sid encouraged me upon my arrival to Yale to meet other people, 
Of course, I didn't do it. Not in the first year, at least. I did email to people, however, and one of these was a person whose work I admired tremendously, Thomas Joyner. Already 15, 14 years ago, and at a very young age, Thomas Joyner was profoundly respected for his groundbreaking work on interpersonal processes in depression. I told Sid, we must collaborate with this guy. Sure, he said. Send him an email. Within seconds of my emailing, a reply was received. Sure, let's collaborate. I he even have the pertinent data. This is a paper that the four of us have co-authored, Thomas, David Zurov, Sid, and myself, which further attests to the ominous vulnerability status of self-criticism. Recognize this, Avi? When it was first rejected from Journal of Abnormal Psychology, the polite rejection message began with this manuscript authored by a group of distinguished researchers. I knew they were not referring to me. Still, I felt tremendously privileged to being able to work with these three. Thomas Joyner is the Robert O. Lawton Distinguished Professor of Psychology at Florida State University. He's, the leading, he's a leading psychopathology researcher and is acknowledged by many experts as the leading figure in suicidality research. His book, Why, Do People, Why People Die by Suicide, published by Harvard Press, right, Thomas? Serves as a source of inspiration for researchers, clinicians, and suicide survivors, those who have lost their loved ones to suicide. Professor Joyner is the author of a breathtaking number of articles, many of them in top tier journals in psychology and psychiatry. He's the author of 17 books, the recipient of highly prestigious awards and grants, and an outstanding mentor in his own right. My own lab was built after, uh, inspired by the lab that uh, Thomas has founded at FSU. Thomas too knows how to free adaptive structures in people. Joyner's theoretical and empirical work is transdisciplinary and biopsychosocial. Nevertheless, as is apparent from the name of his interpersonal psychological theory of suicide, the psychological element is paramount in his work. He integrates cognitive and cognitive behavioral, interpersonal, and humanistic tenets in his work. Thomas, Sid respected you very much, and he took a liking to the fact that we work together. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation to deliver the first Sidney Blapp Memorial Lecture on Depression. I am thanking you not only personally, but also on behalf of BGU and on behalf of Sid. Thank you very much.